Hi everyone and welcome to Cherry Red TV. In a career now spanning over 35 years, Paul Young has enjoyed immense success around the world. During the 1980s, he was one of the UK's biggest music stars and a refusal to be restricted in his career choices has led him along a diverse and enjoyable path ever since. Paul's latest project is a new album with his Tex-Mex band Los Pacaminos called A Fistful of Statins. Paul joins me today to look back across his career and forward to the new record. Paul, welcome. Thanks very much. Um, we've got quite a lengthy career to uh, cover in a reasonably <laughs> oh, brief time. Have, yeah. um, so to start with, could you sort of briefly tell us a bit about your early life and kind of particularly when music began to play a big part in it? Yeah, um, I, I took piano lessons when I was young and uh, taught myself the guitar and uh, so I started piano about seven but it gave me a rudimentary knowledge of music so I started to pick up on radio quite quickly and the stuff that was being played around about then which would be late 60s stuff like Jethro Tull and all that kind of explosion of music, uh, Island Records in particular, free bands like that, and Mot, yeah. The Hoople, I loved all that. Um, I got in my first band uh, when I was, uh, well, as soon as I, as soon as I got a job and started earning money, uh, which was an apprenticeship at Vauxhall, I saved up and I wanted to be a singer in a band, but so did my friend, and so he'd get the singing gigs because he looked like Robert Plant and I didn't. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and the prevalence in our area was for that type of rock music, you know, which wasn't my kind of style when I sang. I was more blues influenced. I ended up playing bass, so I bought a bass rig and uh, my first couple of bands I was playing bass. Um, I always had an eye on the uh, the microphone at the front. Um, even though I enjoyed playing bass, I, I still felt that I wanted to do that as well. And uh, so they gave me a little spot in the middle of the show where I'd do three or four songs and that got a bit longer, five or six songs, and then there was an argument with the singer and then I ended up getting the whole lot. By this time, though, I was fed up with... Um, I didn't think I was going to get the, the, um, the, the singer spot. So um, I'd been approached by a band from the Harrow area who'd done some demos in Luton, where I come from, uh, and they said they were looking for a singer. And the local guy who owned the studio said, oh, a band came in the other day and it, this kid's got quite a good voice and played them the stuff I'd done. And then they got in touch with me. So uh, just around about the time that my Luton band said, OK, you can be the lead singer, I'd actually said yes to this other lot. So <laughs> they kind of missed me by a whisper. And when you, when you kind of started off, as you said, they gave you those little spots in the, in the midst of the set. Mm. You kind of immediately went for the kind of soulful R and B type stuff. Is yeah. that kind of was that kind of you know always a big influence for you right from the beginning? Yes, it was because, like I said, I was a big fan of Free. Those were my main band, really. Uh, I liked everything. I mean, if I could, when I played bass, I played like a, like Andy Fraser, and uh, when I sang, it, it had a blues influence that was similar to Paul Rogers. Uh, I also listened to what they listened to, so I got further and further into blues and then soul, like Wilson Pickett and things like that, were some of the things that he would listen to. So then I started to get into that side of things. And the songs that I would do included sort of Bill Withers, Ain't No Sunshine. Uh, but, and uh, Jess Roden, I was, I was really into Jess Roden at the time, who was a little known English singer. He was coming through from the Alan Bounds set and this type of thing, and he was signed to Ireland. He did a beautiful solo. A record just called Jess Road, and um, we did a song or two from that. And I also did uh, That's What the Blues is All About by Albert King. So it was already kind of R&B based. Yeah. And the first sort of taste of success that you had was with that band you joined, Street Band. Yeah. Um, and you had a, a top 20 hit in the late 70s with a, a quirky little number called yes. Toast. Yeah. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about how that came about, that song? Um, we were looking for a producer they were going to hook us up with uh, because we had a kind of a we, we were kind of it was a rock band uh, that did some funk as well um, and it got rockier once we signed the record deal but we were influenced by bands like Pato and The Who and things like that and Cream so all these bands kind of had a sense of humour in their lyrics um, and 
a little bit Cockney, you might say, as well, Steve Marriott as well, that type yeah. of thing. So we had a little bit of that edge to us. Um, and um, so Chaz Jankel, who produced the Enduring the Blockheads, was going to be the producer. He came down to see us at a pub in Chiswick. And it just so happened that night that um, the, the rhythm player broke a string. It was his band, really. Uh, we had two um, fledgling roadies, so they couldn't change the guitar string, and he had to go off and do it himself. So in this interim period, the band just started chugging away on a little rhythm pattern thing. Like, it was supposed to be a... It was supposed to be amusing because it was like a, they started playing like a jazz thing, a downward okay. sequence that was actually, it was actually, lover, when you're near me, always dancing okay. around the floor, <laughs> lover, please come into my heart. You know? and, uh, and if you listen, that's the downward sequence in the song. And I was talking over the top of it. And as it reached the end of that downward sequence, I'd said to, it was a Sunday and I'd said, couldn't find anything to eat this morning. What did you do? I'll tell you what I did. I just had a bit of toast. And then... I thought, oh, that was quite good, so I said it again, <laughs> said toast. And, uh, and then I just yacked over the top of the rhythm, kind of like a kind of early rapping type thing, yeah. um, picking up on the rhythm of it. Um, when it came to the studio the following week, Chaz said, we must record that song you did. And uh, I'd already forgotten what we'd done, you know. <laughs> so you we had to remember to, your lyrics. Yeah, we again. had to think about it. I, I couldn't really remember. Um, so he said, well, just write a few uh, key lines down, you know, and, uh, and go in and do it, and it'll be amusing as the B-side, you know, for people to find it. Um, so we thought, okay, fair enough, but we didn't realise it when it came out. Um, Kenny Everett played it first, I think, and then uh, their phone lines went mad, and the record company who... Uh, were called Logo at that point, and they hadn't, they'd been around for two, three years, hadn't had any hits at all, got a, a whiff of a hit, said, right, we're flipping it, and we were really against it, but um, it ended up being the B-side. And so people thought we were a comedy act. Uh, we responded by playing louder, faster, and, and just, <laughs> you know, and um, scared all but the, the, the heavy fans away, you know. So was, was it a, a bit of a frustration in a way that kind of it didn't really reflect the band, that, that hit record? Well, I thought on its own and left where it was, it would have done. Because if Cream can do My Baby's Gone Down the Plug Hole you know, and <laughs> things like that and get away with it, we thought we could as well. And, uh, and when you listen to songs like The Universal and Lazy Sunday Afternoon, they've got an element of humour about them. So we thought, well, that's OK, you know, most English bands do. And a kind of a and the Who as well, like Boris the Spider and all the yeah. things that they do, but it, within the context of everything else, it was fine. But that's not great to be your first single, and that's where it went wrong for us. And then when Street Band came to an end, you you then formed a band called the Q-Tips, um, who kind of didn't sort of have chart success as such, but you toured kind of ceaselessly for about three years. You supported yeah. people like Bob Marley, The Who, as you as you've talked about. Um, what was that period kind of like for you? Because obviously at that point, you'd been in bands sort of four or five years. You hadn't kind of sort of broken through mm. long term, if you like. Mm. Were you kind of getting frustrated or was it always, this is a matter of time, it's going to happen for me? Uh, I don't think... I think it's a Capricorn trait. I don't look too far ahead. Things were going great the way they were. Street band, it didn't work out. But um, when the other guitar player went off to get married in Germany, uh, we didn't want to cancel the shows. So the street band became uh, the Harrow Horns. And we just got some brass players in and just turned up and said, no, we're not doing street band songs this evening. <laughs> we're doing this. And so we uh, learnt a soul set. And I must admit, uh, after those two weeks, when he was on honeymoon, I thought, I like that. I fancy doing a bit more of that somewhere down the line. So street band split and um, three of us actually stayed together and we formed the Q-tips. So, um, and then, like you say, very quickly, we became known on the circuit as a great live act. Um, and we, I think one year we ended up doing something like 250 gigs in a year and and made an album so it's pretty non-stop really but we built a following up 
I got a great reputation, the whole band did, but I got a great reputation as being a good lead singer and, and fronting a, an amazing live act. And we were filling out universities and colleges that Bad Manners and Madness were playing, same size halls, and we hadn't even had a hit. So it was just word of mouth. Yeah. Do you think that that kind of, you know, intense touring and live experience was, was something that kind of really stood you in good stead for when the success came a couple yeah. of years later? Yeah, I definitely do. It gave me a chance to find my feet on stage, find my own personality on stage, which is the one thing that I think is missing with a lot of the stars that come up now that are hoping to be found and developed. Well, to be developed by someone else, then you're not really your own person. You haven't had a chance to find yourself. And I, I, I was lucky and I had that opportunity a little bit in street band. Um, I mean, in street band, I remember I used to just get hold of the mic and sing with my eyes wide open. Then the manager said, um, there's no emotion when you sing, you need to give it a bit more motion, shut your eyes, you know. And so then I did the next few gigs with my eyes shut <laughs> for the, <laughs> the whole time. And that's, that was the extent of it. But then by the time I'd got in the Q-tips, uh, I was starting to learn how to get around the stage a bit and, and do a few mic stand antics and things like that, you know. And uh, so all that learning process was fantastic for when it finally happened. Yeah. And then in, in, in 82, you signed the solo deal with CBS. Mm -hmm. was, was that sort of a conscious decision on your part at that time? You know, you've been with bands all mm -hmm. your career up to that point. Was it, this is the right time for me to, to strike out by myself? Um, I've started to call myself recently the reluctant solo star because it was never in the plans. It was just because the Q-tips were out of a deal. Uh, the manager was the manager of the Q-tips because he'd seen me in street band. In fact, he was my agent. And when I, he just kept calling me when street band had split. He said, what are you doing now, Paul? What, would, would just keep in touch with me and let me know. So I told him about the Q-tips. And uh, he said, right, I'd like to manage you guys. Um, and so he, he said to me, I'm trying to get a deal for the Q-tips, but a lot of things had happened in the music business at that point, and they were signing people like Blamange and Soft Cell, a duo, nice, cheap, running thing. You know, <laughs> no one wanted a seven-piece band. Um, and he said, uh, he said, I've had offers by more than one label to take you. Um, and so it was one of those things, I didn't think I must be heard as a solo artist, but I started writing material for the Q-tips um, with the keyboard player and there was a divide that was happening of this kind of quite easy going party type songs that were being written by some of the other guys and then my stuff with with Ian the keyboard player that was starting to have an R&B bass but it was kind of going somewhere else and so I looked at that and I looked at the offer of a deal and thought well maybe I can do a rod in the faces thing and I'll keep the q-tips going and I'll do the odd solo album and that was the plan um, it didn't quite work out like that though <laughs> for you or Rod <laughs> <laughs> no, it worked okay for Rod and it worked okay for me in the end but um, no uh, it upset a couple of people in the q-tips that I would take a solo deal and they didn't see it like a rod in the faces thing at all they thought I'd let them down um, so the band split and um, we actually had to reform the band because a whacking great tax bill came in and uh, <laughs> so the final tour the Q-tips did, the brass section and the drummer had already gone off with Adam and the Ants and uh, we drafted in the Dexys brass section, okay. which was funny because we'd always been put as, as arch enemies, you know, and uh, we had a great tour. Uh, and I'd started my solo recordings and I'd found the Wealthy Tarts. So uh, they said, you better take us. So we ended up having the Wealthy Tarts with the Q-tips as well, which was, <laughs> which was a, an amazing sound. And then your third solo single, cover of the Marvin Gaye track, Wherever I Lay My Hat, was a big breakthrough for you. Mm -hmm. Went on to top the charts for several weeks in 83. Mm -hmm. um, can you remember the feeling of that sort of first flush of success, if you like? Yeah, I can. Um, I'd built up a lot of well-intentioned uh, radio support DJs that had seen the Q-tips and thought they were great. And uh, so, so uh, when DJs had still some influence over what was played on their shows, 
I, th I think they stuck their neck out for me. People like Mike Reed and Peter Powell, um, they were they were playing my stuff. And um, although the first two didn't go, and CBS were very unsure of what it was I was up to because they signed me as the singer of the Q-Tips and then said they were going to put the perfect soul band together and make the album the Q-Tips should have made. And I went, oh no, that's not my plan at all. <laughs> so they were very, very careful about what tracks I recorded. We had to agree before we went in. And when I actually threw one song out and put Love of the Common People in its place, they actually told me to leave the studio. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, iron out the rough spots as well. We had we were talking to a video director who had a great idea for on the rough spots with a, a kind of a kitchen floor and all these giant irons kind of coming down you know like that type of iron and um, dropping into the floor and me having to move around but uh, the budget was way beyond what <laughs> cbs were thinking of spending on me at all so uh third single went to number one they did put up the money to do a video for that because they could see things were starting to happen and it just crept up three spaces at a time. It was like Chinese water torture. It was because every three steps, it was like, yeah, but it might be three steps back the following week. But um, that was before people found their way around rigging the charts. So <laughs> a little bit like saying the record's coming out and getting it on the radio, but actually it's not out yet. So the back orders would start to yeah. come out and then you could shoot a record up, you know. So that wasn't really happening at that point. And so it was painstakingly slow to see it move. But fantastic, obviously, when, when it reached that number one spot. Yeah, it was, especially to go from nowhere to, well, effectively, that's how the public saw it. I yeah. mean, I, I know the legwork that I put in, but to not have had a hit at all, even with the Q-tips, we had a lot of radio play, but we might, I'd have to check it actually, have made a dent in the top 30, I'm not sure. I don't think so from my research, but no. um, yeah, I mean, a fantastic achievement, as you say. And as you said, you kind of went, you, when you went in to do the recording, you, I, I've read that you kind of wanted to take a bit more of a modern approach to the sound at that point. As you say, you come, become known for the more traditional R&B sound. But you yeah. kind of wanted to kind of bring in synthesizers and, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. kind of make it a little bit more modern in terms of where we were in, in, 80, in the early 80s, if you like. That was it, yeah. And uh, the first three demos that I made for CPS, one was a complete kind of synthesised riff called uh, Behind Your Smile that ended up getting a remix and becoming the extra track on No Parley. Then there was a kind of synthesised kind of soul ballad called Everything Was Changed. It ended up on the second album. The third song was a, a Zydeco song called Maison Fonds. So you can see why CBS were a little bit, what is this guy <laughs> up to? Uh, but yeah, I was just trying stuff out. Um, I think what made No Parley work so well is I was on top of my game at that point. I've been doing a lot of singing, a lot of performing on stage. I was actually playing a bit of guitar, a little bit of keyboards. Um, um, Ian embraced synthesizers, even though he was an accomplished piano and organ player. So his approach to playing um, synthesizers was quite different to a younger guy that was much more into the programming side of it. He was into the aesthetics, a uh, big Van Gelis fan, as was I, um, which you can hear on songs like Man in the Iron Mask, it's obvious. Um, and so there was that. There was Laurie's Laurie Latham, the producers, kind of, uh, he'd produced a lot of underground bands that were around at that point, so never had had a hit record, but had a fantastic pair of ears and some great, uh, he, he, he was from the George Martin School of Recording where you experiment, use loops and things like that. And up until then, I thought the studio was boring, but once I got in with Laurie, I was loving it. And, uh, and my approach was more OK, I, I sing in an R&B fashion, but we've got to put all this stuff around it that's going to make it sound more modern and more of the moment. Yeah. And the, the follow-up single, Come Back and Stay, was a, a massive hit across Europe as mm -hmm. well. That's kind of yeah. widening your fan base outside of the UK. Um, and I guess your touring schedule started to really ramp up as a, as a result of that. You, mm -hmm. you kind of went over and did a tour in the US uh, in early 84. Yeah. Um, and you started having some, some vocal problems 
Uh, yeah, was was that as a result of kind of stepping up the touring? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was always because it was a high energy show and it's a high end of my range all the time. And and there was non-stop press to do. I mean, even when on the tour bus when I should be relaxing, they were getting journalists in. So I was being interviewed on the way to the gig. So I, I was never resting my voice, you know. Um, and then 13 shows in 14 days across America is not a good idea when I'm getting up at five o'clock to do a morning TV show and sing live on some things and then catch a plane to catch up the others who are on a bus to go to the next thing. It was a ridiculous schedule. And um, I collapsed from an exhaustion on the show before the big New York show and I slept for about 24 hours and missed the whole show. So we had to, <laughs> we, we had to cancel it. And the record company were really annoyed, but then <laughs> if they look at the schedule they gave me, I'd, I'd have to be superhuman to be able to pull it off. Yeah, it does. It does kind of impose physical limits, like, you know, when mm. you get like that. Um, so, for someone who's kind of so reliant on your voice, that must have been quite a concerning period for you. Yeah, I'd done it once before in street band. That was when I didn't really know what was going on because we were running out of money. They didn't want to pay much for a second album for street band. And uh, so um, we were doing all the backing vocals ourselves. And as the band, we were also by this time into Earth, Wind and Fire. So we decided to stack vocals. And I was doing three days solid of singing 12 hours in the studio. You know, it's ridiculous. Uh, but I was young and I didn't know any better. So I knew and I damaged it. And I th at that point, I thought it wouldn't come back. But it did come back and I ended up in the Q-tip. So I thought, well, I must have done the same thing again. Muscle strain. So um, I kind of knew it was coming back, but it was the frustration of the length of time it takes and laying all these people off that work for you and feeling kind of guilty about that. That really didn't help. But eventually you, you kind of got through that. Um, yeah, I got, uh, so once again I lost it, but then I got it back for the second album and then I had a hit with Every Time You Go Away in, and in, in America. So In late 84 you got a call from Bob Geldof um, asking you to take part in the Band Aid charity single, mm. which of course became you know an incredible worldwide phenomenon. Um, and you managed to bag the opening lines. Yeah, that was at the end of the day I think that happened. I'd, I'd already... Uh, I'd done the middle section that was um, that was already deemed to be the part I was going to do um, and they called me in a little bit later and said that they'd like me to do the first and uh, that's where it gets misty because uh, <laughs> Bob doesn't seem to remember anything to do with David Bowie but I'm sure someone said to me well we would have had David Bowie but he's in Japan he can't get back right. you know, and I'm sure that was said so uh, but for However it came about, yeah, I ended up getting the first line and uh, I had no idea at the time that it would end up being such a, a sort of um, an important thing. Yeah. Especially in America because they were going, well, we know who Boy George is and George Michael and uh, so, but who's this guy, you know, at the front <laughs> of the record. So, so that kind of got my foot in the door, really. And then you went on off the back of that to perform at the Live Aid show the following mm -hmm. summer. Yeah. That must have been an incredible day as well. That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very, very good day. Um, all of those things now, they kind of... It's just like a whirlwind of things that were happening. And uh, I, um, I think I was in America, and so we asked, can we go on the American stage? And, but it was too much. Oh, no, what if we put you there, then we've got to move this person there. And they, and they couldn't be bothered. So I had to come back to do my part. And also, because I was going to stay out there and have a holiday. <laughs> so <laughs> and I'd booked it. Um, so we needed to fly over, do Live Aid, and then try and get away on my holiday the day after the show. Find them where, as and where you can, I suppose, in those days was mm. difficult. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as you say, in the summer of 85, you, you had a US number one with mm. Every Time You Go Away. Yeah. As someone that's kind of such a big fan of American songs, American singers, mm. did that kind of mean a lot to you to have a hit there? Yeah, it definitely did, yeah. Um, it was um, one of those things. Well, I think when I got an English number one, that was about as far as I was seeing. That's what I mean. I don't look... I haven't got one great, like, big picture that... or. So it's somewhere that I have to get to. Um, so when I got number one in England, 
that was all I'd ever dreamed about, I suppose, really, with all the bands that I knew that I liked. I didn't know if they were successful elsewhere. So that was that. When I started to travel a, a bit, I thought, oh, this is kind of more than I was ever expecting. And then um, to get a number one in America was, I don't know, it was way, way beyond what I ever thought I could achieve, you know. So between 83 and 85, in the UK alone, you had seven consecutive top 20 singles, mm -hmm. two number one albums. I mean, you were one of the, the biggest stars in the country during that period. Um, but I've read interviews where you said that there's kind of aspects of, th of that and the attendant fame that you didn't enjoy, that you felt kind of a little bit claustrophobic at times, um, yeah. a little bit out of control. Were you still kind of enjoying the musical side of it, if not the fame side, if you like? Yeah, I was still enjoying the musical side. As soon as I got up on the stage, it, it was great. I was having fun up there. Um, I was enjoying myself. Um, I think I used to run a pretty good band, you know. Uh, most of the guys that work with me have very fond memories of the tours. Uh, the three guys that sang the backing vocals on uh, Every Time You Go Away, J Jimmy, George and Tony, they were already getting a little bit mature in their years and they decided that touring wasn't for them anymore, they would just do studio stuff. I convinced them to come out on the road with me and, and uh, George says to me a few years later, he said that was always the best tour I ever did. And he said, I never thought I'd tour again, but he said it was so much fun, you know. And we were all very close. Um, I think that's what makes it work. You've really got to do that, you know. And so the stage part was great. It was just, um, when I got back to the hotel, I still saw them as my friends and, and uh, I wanted to be able to relax and in the bar and things like that. And the more and more famous I got, the more people managed to find their way into my hotel um, to the point where security was saying it might be better if I didn't come down to the bar and, and then it might be better if I didn't step out of my room because they've got in and they're just systematically going through the floors up and down in the lifts hoping that they'll come across me. And then I started to kind of develop claustrophobia because of that. I thought, oh, I'm like a prisoner now, you know. Um, I think part of the enjoyment of, of deciding to ride a motorcycle was to try and get an opposite to that, where it wasn't four walls around me. Yeah. And uh, so I really enjoyed that uh, motorcycling, you know, that, that freedom. And, and sort of as that led into the second part of the 80s, you, you had a family and you kind of decided to sort of step away a little bit from the limelight and, and spend more time with your family. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's probably not a decision that many artists of the stature that you had then would have taken. Did it, did it feel like a bit of a risk to do that? It felt like a risk, but I thought, I'm not enjoying it any, anymore. And um, I'm not... Uh, I guess I'm not a great businessman. I'm just whatever I do, I want to. I want to be able to enjoy it, which is as we will get onto the Pacaminos later. Part of the reason for getting a band like that was to be to be able to get the fun back. Um, so yeah, I took time off. Um, I didn't want to be an errant dad. Um, I wanted to be around, especially in the early years when they were small. So, uh, Levi was born in 87, and I think it was nearly three years before uh, the next album came out. And um, it was good because I spent a year, 18 months at home, then I started recording the, the next album. But uh, when you're recording, you're still going home at the end of every day and you can still see them. Even when we did the recordings in America, we went over as a family because she was young enough not to be put into school, you know. And uh, so that all worked great. And as we move forward into the 90s, I think it, it's fair to say that you kind of started to look for sort of new areas musically to develop your career, kind of not just kind of always doing the straight ahead sort of more pop stuff. Um, your contract with CBS came to an end, I think, kind of early 90s. Yeah. Um, I've read a quote from you around that time sort of saying that every artist wants to change, yet every record company wants them to stay the same. Exactly. Was, was that kind of a little bit of a, of a frustrating time in terms of you wanting to forge ahead with new areas and companies seeing it a little bit differently? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the thing is about that, what I was trying to say was it's like, 
they get a success or you get a successful album and they've got the marketing right. So then you come in with something a little bit further down the line. It's not the same as the other album. Uh, so, um, so they have to think about the marketing a little bit more and it might not appear or appeal to um, this certain mainstream. So maybe they need to look at other magazines they might have to advertise it in and things like that. So it, uh, they don't like that. They like to have a game plan that they can stick to. And if you change your music too much, there's a chance that that won't happen. So they've got to rethink the strategy. And that's what I was trying to say really. Also in the early years, because I was successful, they had no idea that it was going to go quadruple platinum, the first album. Uh, it may even be more than that now, but I've got a quadruple platinum one at home. <laughs> uh, uh, in fact, they rushed out the first album because, and, th and I re remember such someone saying, with a bit of luck, it might go silver. So, so they still weren't sure where I was going. And then when it did, they thought, oh, he must really know what he's doing, <laughs> which is not true. Um, <laughs> so uh, they, they didn't really interrupt my um, artistic bent, you know. Uh, and it was only when, when they started to get not quite so high in the chart, then they started to get in a little bit, say, well, we think you should do this and do that. And um, that failed miserably on the third album <laughs> because the Americans were going, we don't know how to market an artist like you. You're, R&B one minute, your soul, then your rock, you know. And, uh, uh, what they really didn't like was the fact that Tear Your Playhouse Down was a rock track, but it wasn't a guitars playing the riff, it was an Optivider on a bass. Yeah. So, and true to form, they couldn't get it on rock radio because of that. So I thought, how ridiculous that there has to be a guitar, you know. Um, and it was all that kind of frustration. So was the formation of Los Pacaminos um, in the early 90s, was that kind of a little bit of you escaping from those frustrations, getting back to something that you really enjoyed doing? Yeah, it was, it, it was very much, I thought, I don't know the first thing about Tex-Mex, all I know is I'm listening to a lot of Rai Kuda. I really, really like it. And in the period of the uh, late 70s, early 80s, that's what he was doing a lot of. He, and he'd still got some R&B singers that he drafted in, um, uh, no, in fact, he just got those in at that point. And, but he also had some Mexican musicians. And it was a, quite a curious mix of soulful vocals with this uh, lovely melancholy, the ballads were beautiful, you know, this type of thing. So I thought, mm, I'd like to explore that side of music a bit. Um, so I called up friends, most of whom, um, Matt and Mark, who were in the band, um, played on No Parley. Um, Jamie had been with me through most of the uh, late 80s, early 90s playing the guitar. Um, and so I was just calling people, oh, and Drew, uh, he'd, I'd covered some songs of his and I just thought he had such a lovely voice. I was so surprised he hadn't got his own ca um, career as a singer. Um, so, and then I started writing with him. We did about five of Drew's, I think, on the Don Was album, The Crossing. Um, so bit by bit it all came together, but like you say, it was me having fun again. So I was really resistant to, I wanted to keep it small, you know. I didn't want it to get big. So we really, really held back about doing any recording and things like that. We had our, we had our arms put around our backs by the fans to make an album after 10 <laughs> years. And uh, to our surprise, we made a really, really good one. And um, How was the experience of doing that for you? Because obviously you'd, you'd had sort of 10, 12 years of making solo records up yeah. to that point. Was that kind of a different experience working with a band, if you like? Um, well, I'll tell you what, there's actually no big change. When, when I did No Parley, uh, we decided, for instance, we wanted to get Pino in um, to play bass. So, because uh, the wealthy tarts we got first, then Maz was going out with Pino and sh she said, well, he's loving all the rough mixes that I bring home. So I thought, well, we'll get Pino in to work on something. And he came in to play on wherever I lay my hat. And um, I don't... I don't tell people what to play. I might have an idea in my head, but I'd rather hear what they think first, because they're musicians, you know. He can play a bass much better than I can. Uh, I can only think of a line. So um, he played something that was not what I was thinking he was going to play. And um, I was thinking, should I change? Should I tell him to play this, this, this? And I thought, no, actually, I'm going to change what we've done so far. So we went back and rejiggled the, the drum machine part a little bit. 
And uh, so working within this context is just the same thing. When we get in, we play. All I ask for Los Pecaminos is that I, that I, I drive the car. Okay. So, so they all have their input, but I just want to be able to make sure that we st that we're pointing in the right direction. And that's it. Uh, and up until then, I'm really into what each member brings. Um, sometimes with Jamie, I can say, I really think the solo should be like this or like that. Or uh, And the great thing about Jamie is um, he's malleable. You know, he can play lots and lots of different styles. And, um, and so we can try something different. And, uh, and that's, an uh, that's another side of it that I really like. And of course, you know, as you say, there's, there's an immense amount of experience between everybody in the band in terms of people that they've played with, yeah. tours that they've done. Mm -hmm. That must make the life part of it kind of very comfortable and enjoyable. Yeah, it's very, very comfortable. Um, like you say, they're all seasoned players. Of, and we, we found Melvin Duffy along the way as well, who's a gifted pedal steel player. There's not, obviously, there's not that many in this country, but... Uh, Melvin's got a slight, slight different bent on it. He doesn't play it always in a traditional country way, so we can really push things a little bit. He, he'll put distortion on it and play slide and things. So um, being able to use all these, and Matt turned out to be a great... He had a great understanding of Tex-Mex music, and he turned in on a couple of songs, and they were absolutely on the money. And when you go out and play live, do you find that... You're kind of playing to long-term Paul Young fans, or has the band kind of over the years now started to garner its own following as such? Yeah, we started off with a lot of resistance because obviously we try to play small places, but uh, most of the landlords just couldn't hold back from sending out little surreptitious flies that they thought we wouldn't see, say, saying Paul Young in massive letters <laughs> and lost pack aminos. Or in one pub as they famously called us on the poster, Lost Pack of Nanas, <laughs> <laughs> which I've kept. <laughs> and uh, um, so, oh yeah, we used to have some dreadful, uh, we, because the stage was at one end of this pub in Elephant and Castle and our dressing room was way the other side of the fans and they were getting very shirty <laughs> that we weren't doing any, any Paul Young songs. We did Wherever I Lay My Hat, but believe me, with a squeeze box and no drum machine, it doesn't sound <laughs> anything like the record. Very different version. So they looked really confused, and then we put the guitars in and shot up the back <laughs> and, and got away. But uh, so some Paul Young fans, some fell on stony ground, you know, and they <laughs> went, don't understand this at all. Others went, oh, we like this. And uh, they'd tell some friends, I know you... You weren't a fan of Paul Young, but this is nothing like that. You've got to come and see it. So then we started getting some new fans. And um, now we've got some Paul Young fans who go, actually, we prefer the Pacaminos, <laughs> and uh, we like to come to this. Because you're getting, you're getting a lot of different personalities. So some people love Drew, some people come because I'm in it, some people love Jamie. Matt's got a very quirky sense of humour, and he's got a thing about him. So each individual person... It is drawing people in. And that was the other thing about the band. I said, when I got the band going, I said, uh, I want to be back in the band again. That's where, I'll, that's where I'm comfortable. Uh, so I don't, I'll sing a song or two, but I want you to sing a song. I want Jamie, I want you to sing a song. I want to be able to step back and back you because all these things I can't do as Paul Young. Can't write an instrumental. Can't go out on a Paul Young stage. Get and the <laughs> band play for three minutes and I don't sing anything. So. I can write instrumentals, I can play the guitar, which also I think people didn't really want, they want me to hold a microphone and walk around stage, play the guitar, I can do backing vocals for other people, work on harmonies, which is another thing I really like to do. Um, so all these things, and also I'm more involved in the production on Los Pacaminos too. So you're about to release a new Los Pacaminos album called mm -hmm. A Fistful of Statins. Um, care to expand on the title? <laughs> Jamie said it as a joke one day. So many things get said in the dressing room that, God, if we could write them down, and uh, we, sometimes we go, we must get that into a song. So this one ended up as the title. I think we were at the point where we were talking about our medical conditions more, <laughs> more than about the sex, the drugs, and the rock and roll. And, um, and uh, it kind of struck a chord with the fact that none of us are getting any younger. And uh, probably half the band are on them. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it just killed us at 
the, uh, the time. I know that, that uh, sometimes having a jokey title for a, an album isn't such a great idea, but I think that um, statins, to a younger person, it doesn't mean anything. In fact, they probably don't even know a fistful of dollars. So, um, so it's just a title to them, and if they like it, they like it. Because my daughter was saying, do you think you should have a jokey title because it's, it's implying about your age, and yet she says, I think it's a really cool record. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, and I said, no, I, I don't think it will make, it make a big difference. But to us it means, and to people of a certain age, it puts a smile on their face and they know exactly what we're talking about. And it's a, also it's a kind of a reflection of the stories that are on there about people that, uh, songs like Don't Make Me Wait, Senorita, these kind of things wouldn't happen to a 20 year old, but they would for someone who's 30, 35, where he's uh, two or three heavy relationships in and he thinks he's just getting somewhere and then, she gets wooed away by someone else yet again you know? <laughs> um, and so that's what the kind of that's what a lot of the songs are kind of about really so it, it, I mean it's been 12 years since the first album <laughs> yeah what why was now sort of the right time to make another one um, our arm was twisted again by the fans isn't it time you made another one we've been writing and talking about it and putting it off and writing and talking about it and putting it off and then maybe jamie would go away because he'd got another gig or i'd got some shows and then we couldn't get time in and then um, we had a little health scare in the band and and, and we thought oh, well we probably need to um crack on with this and see what we've got um and then we started to get all the songs together that we'd got and then we realized actually we'd got we'd got enough um, more than enough and then as the recording went on the engineer said you know what he said I thought the first album was good but I, I reckon you got something better than the first here and um, and the more and more recording and adding that we did um, the more we realized that and I thought this time we've got to be serious about this record and actually although I always wanted to keep Pacamino small and something that I could just go and enjoy uh, so that we don't get caught in the album promotion tour wheel um here i am doing it again <laughs> because <laughs> because i think i think the world needs to know about the pacaminos and it is so much fun it, it's fun if you see it if you're in it it's even better i mean you talk about i was talking about uh, you said that we uh, i supported bob marley yeah with the q-tips well on that bill was the average white band ha hamish stewart who's doing backing vocals on this album okay. and uh it's funny that turnaround because we played Hamish's place a couple of times and he loves it too. And uh, he's now st stepped in, played bass with us a few weeks ago and he's up for doing it any time again because it is such a gas. And can you kind of tell us a little bit about the song choices for the album? Did, did you lean kind of towards the traditional Tex-Mex style or was it a little bit more experimental? Um, I think what's happened is, it's like the Beatles, they started off playing R&B covers that came over on the boats in Liverpool when uh, the sailors brought the rec records back um, before they started to write their own. So what's happened is we've lived a little in the Tex-Mex genre, we've, we've done Tex-Mex covers, we've then taken other songs and Tex-Mexed them and given them a treatment and uh, it just seemed to be, and it is true a lot of people say this, the songs kind of dictate where you're going. And so when we were writing for this second album, the songs, I'd say we're less Tex-Mex, more of a cowboy band, and we play border music because um, there's a song called Our Favourite Things on the album, and um, the accordion pattern I heard in my head, is, um, is less Tex-Mex, more New Orleans. So it's all really songs and stories across the border and if we can flick into that a little bit st straight straight ahead Texas rock and roll um, and then some uh, there's a ballad called Jump Back Baby that every time I hear it I can see myself in a in with a band playing in a open bar in the Yucatan or something like that and you can see the sea and it's just you know I just get pictures in my mind every time I hear the songs. So as, we, as I said at the beginning you know we're, we're sort of over 35 years into your career you've done soul, R&B, pop, you've done a Christmas album, you've done a swing album. I've done some pretty heavy rock stuff as well. Yeah exactly. Um, any kind of unfulfilled musical ambitions <laughs> <laughs> that you want to have a crack at next? Turkish. <laughs> um, there are some things I think that, that 
you'd have to go off and study them for 10 years or, or you have to start it when you're 17 or something stuff like i looked at mariachi music for a while because i i'm listening to all the mexican stuff and um I found this amazing shop in LA where I, where I play a thing called a Bajo Sexto on here. Uh, you have to have one if you, if you, if you play conjunto music, uh, which is a bass, a Bajo Sexto and an accordion and two or three voices. So anyway, I went back to this shop and I got a vihuela, which is the top end instrument they play in mariachi and I realised it's like learning classical music, only it's all patterns. Now that's got a name. Then something else that goes brum dum dum do da da, you know, it's got another name. So you've got to learn all these patterns, and then and they interweave them all the way through the song. And I thought I could spend the next three years trying to do this, but I'm not in a mariachi band. I'm in a Tex Mex <laughs> band. So I gave I gave it back to them and said I'd like to trade this in on something else. And I got uh, a thing called the requinto, which is something that we can actually use on this. So, as far as any other musical styles go, I think this is probably it. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you see this and kind of the more traditional Paul Young thing existing together in the, in yeah. the coming years? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, just the last um, uh, weekend, I played a Paul Young show followed by a Pacamino show with um, 300 miles in between them. And, uh, that's what makes it fun for me. I think if I was doing just the one thing, it would be getting a bit boring by now. Well, thanks very much for, for joining us to look back over your career and Thank talk you. about the new record. I wish you the very best of success with it. Thank you. And join us more soon for more Cherry Red TV. Talking to my poor old friend About lots of things that he don't comprehend I tell him that she is the world to me The girl for me, my living end I get